I remember vividly what it was like that day. It was very cold. You know, I remember when I was wearing jumper, trousers, um, shoes I was wearing. I remember even looking at the watch. On the 8th of November, 1987, one of the most notorious incidents of the Troubles occurred in the small market town of Enniskillen. And the noise was horrendous from behind. All hell broke loose. As hundreds of people gathered to attend the annual Remembrance Sunday service, an IRA bomb exploded beside the war memorial. The bomb killed 11 people, many of them elderly men and women, and injured dozens more. From what I'd seen, I knew she was dead. I mean, and I remember thinking to stand there, this is something like something out of a horror movie. In an instant, the life of the town and its people had been shattered. But for some, this dark hour would mark a crossroads in the violent history of Northern Ireland. Could have started a civil war. The IRA have accepted responsibility and have expressed their deepest regret at the catastrophic effects of this action. They realised very, very quickly that they had done themselves an awful lot of damage. The silence in the town was, was terrifying. My own view now and at the time was that this was a very, very worrying moment in our history. With a population of just 14,000 people, Enniskillen is a quiet, rural town in central Fermanagh. It's a town that sought to preserve its close-knit community, despite the troubles that, by the mid-1980s, had been raging across Northern Ireland for almost two decades. Fermanagh, and Enniskillen specifically, is a place where community relations were generally very good. People got on very well together. Um, despite the troubles, and despite the level of activity that was going on. I think attitudes historically probably were ingrained, but that didn't mean that people couldn't get along with each other. It didn't mean just because they had differences in what they believed and they went to different schools in different, different areas. It didn't mean that they couldn't get on. But despite the apparent good relations, Enniskillen did not stand apart from the troubles. In 1981, when IRA hunger striker Bobby Sands was elected to Westminster as the local MP, the community had been split down the middle. In 81, um, it became very marked and very tense. Um, it was probably the classic example of where an election really was a sectarian headcount. Constable Crawford was the IRA's first murder victim this year. He died Along with a divided electorate, like any other town in Northern Ireland, Enniskillen had also witnessed its own share of violence and killings. Shock and minor injuries. I think everybody that grew up with the Troubles was familiar with what was actually happening at the time. And uh, don't say we took it for granted, but you became used to it. And it was just unfortunate that, you know, so many tragic events happened in Northern Ireland that it became the norm to hear about people being shot, killed, explosions occurring. Made its way through Enniskillen. I think the influence of the Troubles had, had created problems, obviously. Um, there were <clears throat> not very stark, but nonetheless present fault lines between the Catholic nationalist community and the unionist Protestant community. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I think, you know, it was people got on very well um, and the town functioned very well. In former garrison town, Enniskillen possesses a strong military history. Two regiments, the Royal Enniskilling Fusiliers and the Royal Enniskilling Dragoons, were formed here over 300 years ago. And soldiers from the Skins, as the regiments became known, fought in both the First and Second World Wars. It's a military heritage that is expressed every year on Remembrance Sunday when people gather at the town's war memorial to honour their war dead. Remembrance Sunday, I think, was always a very solemn day in the life of the town. And um, 
I think there were clearly people here with remembrances of their own. And, you know, if you go around the parish churches of Fermanagh, there's probably not one where you don't have a memorial stone on the wall. There's a huge reservoir of memory here about war, especially the First World War. If you look at the war memorial itself, you'll see that a lot of local men did go to fight for the Enniskillens. The, the names even First and Second World War, and even right up to the 70s and 80s, a lot of local men did, from the Protestant and Catholic traditions, both did join the British Army. Although both Catholics and Protestants had served with the local regiments, in the decades after the Second World War, the Remembrance Sunday service came to be more strongly associated with just one side of the community. By and large, it wasn't, there wasn't a big participation by the Catholic community. And you wouldn't say that it, it, it was shunned or anything, but it simply wasn't something that the Catholic community took part in very freely, but there certainly were individuals that took part in it. Some Catholics did go, some Catholics were still members of the Royal British Legion in Enniskillen, but largely um, it was a, it was a, a Protestant uh, ceremony, a Protestant tradition. I usually went with my dad every, every year. Didn't particularly want to go every year, but I think he appreciated the company. I think it's not much to take two minutes to observe a silence, to remember those that give their lives um, for our freedom today. It, it wasn't a trivial matter. It was a solemn, serious matter in the life of the town. I always felt that when lunchtime came on Remembrance Day that something had passed and it was, it was something had lifted from our shoulders. First, the Union flag or... On Saturday, the 7th of November, 1987, the traditions of Remembrance Sunday were already being observed. And in Enniskillen, people were already beginning to prepare for the following morning's service. I remember coming in, and my dad was watching the Remembrance in the Royal Albert Hall, and they have every year on the Saturday night, and he was watching that, and I came in, and he says, do you want to go to the parade tomorrow? And I suppose I couldn't really say no, so I had to go. <laughs> except to one's nearest and dearest. But as people prepared for Remembrance Sunday, elsewhere, other plans were being laid. Equipped with a 40-pound bomb, an IRA unit was on its way to its target. And that target was Enniskillen. The Enniskillen bomb was made by the IRA South Fermanagh Brigade, but seems to have been actually made across the border in the Republic of Ireland. So while the victims were innocent of what was about to happen on the 8th, the IRA unit had been, over the preceding day, moving the bomb into place. At the home of Gordon and Joan Wilson, their youngest daughter, Mary, was back from Belfast for the weekend and was preparing to go out with some friends. I remember Mary saying, don't worry, Mummy, I'll be back early. And uh, Gordon and I talked about uh, the arrangements for the next morning I was going to church. And he and Mary would leave early, about a quarter past 10. To, to bring the bomb across, it's reckoned that up to 30 people were needed. You would have the vehicle carrying the bomb and on ahead you would have other vehicles with people called scouts and they would go a certain distance uh, to make sure there were no security checks and once the coast was clear they would contact back to the vehicle carrying the bomb who would move, move a little further forward. So it was done in a series of relays. Well, it was just a normal night before when you got ready for Sunday and got the shoes cleaned and all the things that was necessary. The night before I'd be preparing my medals, getting them set, on both the coats, the outside coat and the inside coat. And the bomb by the Saturday is on the outskirts of the town. By late on Saturday or by very early on Sunday, it was in place. The bomb was planted in an old community hall, 
known locally as the Reading Rooms, and just across the street from the War Memorial. Very old uh, building, sort of a warren of small rooms and corridors and uh, creaky staircases and so on. It would have been relatively easy then for a couple of local men to guide the IRA unit in and show them where it was and for them to slip in with a, a small bag containing the 40 pound bomb and put it into a cupboard uh, uh, just inside the gable wall. The next morning, with the bomb in place just yards away, people began to arrive at the war memorial for the Remembrance Day service. I remember vividly what it was like that day. It was very cold. There was a bit of rain falling, um, and it was a bit of a gloomy day, I think, over overcast. I remember walking up with my sister and uh, uh, Ronnie Hill was there and uh, Mr Armstrong was there and there were quite a few other people standing around by me. Bally Ray Band always played there every, every time of remembrance. And I think he just loved hearing the music and that was one of the reasons he would go. Mum doesn't usually go. She decided to go that morning, don't know why, but... We all went together in the car. My sister was bringing my mother and my aunt up and I was staying home to get the lunch ready. Otherwise, Siobhan and I would have been at the Cenotaph with Ronnie. I didn't go to it and we were just at home. I had my three children at home. And I remember Mary and Gordon leaving the house. Mary crossed the kitchen and she followed her father to the car. Um, there was a little light rain. So I called after her, Mary, have you got an umbrella? And her last words were, oh yes, of course, Mum, don't fuss. And they went off in the car. As I parked it, I came up uh, the Queen Elizabeth Road, crossing uh, towards where our members, the members of council, would have uh, formed. And I saw Gordon Wilson and Mary uh, coming up East Bridge Street, and I waved to them. I said to my wife, Mr Hill is on his own. He's lonely. I think we'll go over and speak to him near that fence where the building was. That was the, that was the place where everyone wanted to go to see the, the parade, the whole thing, you know. And we took three steps roughly from behind the barrier and another step onto the road. You know, I remember what I was wearing, jumper, trousers, um, shoes I was wearing. I remember even looking at the watch. I was standing in the kitchen and had just put on uh, the show from the Cenotaph in London when I heard a click, a dull thud across the kitchen. I did hear a noise, but I just didn't put much emphasis on it. At um, 10.43, uh, I've heard something like that I've never heard before nor never want to hear again, the noise was horrendous from behind. It was just like um, a cannon going off from behind. I think the split second had happened, I actually knew what it was. And I remember being conscious of the fact, as the rumble was falling on top of me, I remember thinking, this is an IRA bomb. I got down as fast as I could, put my hands over my head, and put my fingers like that there, and waited until this went over. There was a deathly silence for a period. It seemed like a long period, but it really wasn't. A deathly silence, and then suddenly, all hell broke loose. The 
cable wall, you immediately had a pavement, and then again after that you had a, a, a metal railing. So the bomb was inside the reading rooms, and when it exploded, the uh, cable wall disintegrated and fell on top of them. And because there was a metal railing on the other side of the, 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 the pavement, they were trapped between the, the falling masonry and the, uh, the metal railing. There was a lot of confusion, and as you can imagine, with lots of people running around in the rubble trying to pull off huge chunks, people were walking over the top of others that were hidden and concealed. Yeah. 